Good morning. So I'm going to talk about high flow nasal cannula and I'm going to talk about the actions, mechanism of actions, and the limitations. So my disclosure is I do serve or have served on a couple advisory boards, but shouldn't be anything that pertains to this talk. So I want to describe nasal high flow mechanisms of action, identify some of the advantages and limitations of these devices, and maybe discuss a rational approach to the use of nasal high flow. There's multiple devices on the market right now This for nasal high flow devices. And these devices provide heated and humidified oxygen at flow rates from 15 all the way up to 60 liters a minute. There's multiple terminologies when we're talking about high flow devices. We can talk about high flow oxygen therapy, high flow nasal cannula, nasal high flow, transnasal insufflation. There's probably even more than that. Most of these use a specialized nasal cannula, and all of them are used for the support of spontaneous breathing with hypoxia. Cost on these can run approximately $3,000 for a device. Uh, it varies between manufacturer. So what are the mechanisms of actions of this? Well, number one, it humidifies gas and reduces the metabolic cost of gas conditioning. It improves respiratory mechanics. The high flow itself deliver higher FI2, FiO2 versus conventional devices. There's a washout of anatomical dead space, provides some positive airway pressure, and reduces wor work of breathing. And I want to expand on these. Uh, we all know as respiratory therapists anyway that med medical gas coming out of the wall is 99% pure and as dry as a desert. There's no humidity in there at all. And there's a metabolic cost of this gas conditioning. Even gas at room, temp room temperature takes about 26 calories a liter to warm that gas up and humidify it. So in a normal adult, that's about 156 cal calories a minute just to humidify and warm the gas coming into your lungs. Inadequate humidification results in decreased mucociliary transport, secretions build up. There's also a decrease in surfactant production if we have a humidity deficit and increases res airway resistance in the nasal airways. A little study done some time ago back in 1986 pointed this out just simple with a, this was done with a simple nasal cannula with patients breathing room air, medical dry air, room air again, and then humidified air through their nose and through their mouth. And you can see that when they started to breathe dry air, medical gas, there was a significant increase in the resistance in the nasal airways. This wasn't quite seen when they were breathing through their mouth. But clearly when you're breathing dry gas through your nose, it, it really causes an increase in resistance. What about the delivered FiO2? Well, we all have seen the nasal cannula charts and what our FiO2 is on a nasal cannula. What we must remember is that these are based on patients breathing a normal respiratory rate and that delivered oxygen has a lot of uh, components in there. It's based on frequency, oxygen flow, tidal volume, inspiratory time, et cetera, et cetera. What I really want to point out is that simply as respiratory breathing goes up, the actual delivered oxygen goes down considerably and quite fast. So what happens with a nasal cannula is that if the rate goes up, the actually delivered amount of gas is diluted, as rate and tidal volume go up, that gas is diluted by the entrainment of room air. So your real FiO2 is considerably less than what even those charts say. Nasal high flow then, if nasal high flow matches the inspiratory flow of the patient, then what the dialed in on the nasal high flow for FI2 should be the delivered FIO2 to the patient. So that's one of the benefits of it. But keep in mind that some patients breathe with a much higher inspiratory flow than even what nasal high flow can deliver. So that it may have the same effect that if you have it set on 60%, you may not be getting 60%. And this was pointed out in this paper that looked at evaluation of humidified nasal high flow using 
oxygraphy, capnography, and measurement of airway pressures, and they assessed the performance of nasal high flow in healthy volunteers. They measured, they calculated actual flow and measured hyperpharyngeal airway pressures during rest and work. And during rest, they had an inspiratory flow of about 30 liters a minute. And when they exercised them, they developed inspiratory flows of about 120 liters a minute. They had the device six set at 60% and flow rates of 10 all the way up to 50 liters per minute. And you can see that nose breathing at rest, the devices were able to maintain FBIO2s up even up into the close to the targeted 60% when they had flow rates of 60, 50 liters a minute. Once they started opening their mouth, things started changing. They gave pretty good, and particularly when they exercised. Then the FiO2 here was only about 40% when it was set at 60. So again, the higher the inspiratory flow rate, the FiO2 is going to go down. And I'll point out one thing that they didn't do in this paper. They didn't, there was no data from trying to measure what it was when the patient, when these people open their mouth. Because of course, gas is going to take the path of re least resistance, there's going to be much more air entrainment, and your FiO2 is going to fall off. Nasal high flow washes out anatomical dead space. In a nice 3D model that uh, Wilfred Muller used, he showed that nasal high flow washes out dead space. And he measured this using 15, 30, and 45 liters a minute and showed that it took about, at 30 liters a minute, it takes about one second to wash out anatomical dead space, nasal airway dead space, which is about 50 mils or so. And another study by Mundell, who was looking at mechanism of actions in patients in wakefulness and sleep, and he looked at respiratory rate and tidal volume. He found during the patients when they were awake, nasal high flow increased tidal volume and decreased respiratory rate, no change in minute ventilation. But when patients went to sleep, their tidal volume significantly were lower. There was no change in respiratory rate. There was a 20% decrease in minute ventilation, and he attributed this to probably a decrease in dead space ventilation. If we have all that flow, we must generate some positive airway pressure. Uh, Park has done a lot of this research. This one was published in Respiratory Care, measuring pressures at 30, 40, and 50 liters a minute on nasal high flow during both inspiratory and expiratory plateau times, so expiratory times. Uh, on various flows in inspiration, you can see pressures much lower, expiration pressures much higher, because as a patient exhales, it has a resistance to the flow coming in, so pressure is higher. As P must goes, the patient takes a breath in and generates a negative pressure, the pressure is much lower. And she found that in this, that, that the average expiratory pressures, average expiratory pressures on different flow rates varied from two to four based on flow rates. Average inspiratory pressures were almost nothing on these patients, maybe half a centimeter water there couple centimeters out of there. So actually, it's not positive airway pressure or PEEP. Nasal high flow simply increases mean airway pressure. One of the most recent studies looking at this is the same group was looking at, well, does it correlate or is it, how high can we go? And they looked at high flow rates up to 100 liters a minute and were monitoring pressures. And they found that for almost every 10 liters a minute inspiratory flow, there was an increase in mean airway pressure by about 1.16 centimeters of water. One thing I would point out, and I don't have the slide up here, this varies very much from patient to patient. So this is a mean on the average of all patients. Why doesn't it equal CPAP? Mundell, again, in one of his models, looked at this and looked at CPAP. And as I explained before, all CPAP devices, most CPAP devices, can easily generate flow rates over 100 liters a minute. And the ICU CPAP BiPAP devices can go well over 200 a minute so that they maintain a CPAP, the constant positive airway pressure versus nasal high flow or high flow devices if it doesn't meet the patient demand and go above that, it loses the pressure during inspiration. 
but even that little bit of pressure may have some effect. And in this one, in patients with high BMIs, they show that nasal CPAP increased in expiratory lung volume versus conventional low flow oxygen therapy. And in this one, oxygen through nasal high flow increases in expiratory lung volume and it reduces respiratory rate in post-cardiac surgical patients and, use, and they used nasal high flow versus non-conventional. They found significant differences in end expiratory lung volume. Mean airway pressure again was only about three centimeters water, decrease in respiratory rate, increased PF ratios and increases in tidal volume. Overall, they found lung volume increased by 25%. Again, three centimeters of water for airway pressure, a little bit of decrease in respiratory rate, PF ratio increase, and there was a strong correlation between airway pressure and, and expiratory lung volume. In another study looking at critical care patients, 12 subjects with acute hypoxemic respiratory fail, failure, they carry it compared non-rebreather versus nasal high flow versus CPAP of fives, small level of CPAP, and measured. And they found that there was a deep increase, de decreased work of breathing versus nasal high flow versus non-rebreather mask and CPAP. There was significant improvement in PF ratio with the nasal high flow, but the CPAP had significant improvement in PF ratio versus nasal high flow. And there's all the PF ratio I showed that there. So, so overall, the nasal high flow decreased work of breathing and dyspnea in patients increased oxygenation versus a non rebreather, but not versus a CPAP. What about BiPAP then? Well, in this study, they compared nasal high flow versus non invasive BiPAP in cardiac. And they looked at BiPAP with minimal settings versus nas nasal high flow oxygen therapy in a group. And they found there was no difference as far as patients with treatment failure. So they both tolerated it very well. There was no difference in treatment failure, same number, no difference in ICU mortality. BiPAP was associated with much higher PF ratio at one hour and then sustained longer. Nasal high flow, though, was associated with lower respiratory rate and lower PaCO2s. And again, this may be because nasal high flow directly washes out anatomical de dead space. If we say that there is pressure, it also has to increase tidal volume. And this was a one looking at Mandel's study again, nasal high flow rates of 50, 30, and 45 versus controls, where they measured frequency and tidal volume. Here you can see tidal volumes are running somewhere about eight or a little less uh, frequencies. And as they increase nasal high flow, tidal volume goes up also. So that goes back to the question, how much tidal volume should we allow? If you look here at, on this group with nasal high flow of 45 liters a minute, they were generating tidal volumes way up above a liter. So I don't know. You've got to think about that. Um, nasal high flow, cannula and acute respiratory Failure, the Florella trial looked at that and found that there was no difference in inhibition rates of, among groups, but if they separated out in the groups with lower PF ratios, they found that nasal high flow had significantly lower inhibition rates. And as they were talking, maybe it had lower tidal volumes versus BiPAP and C BiPAP patients. But then in another smaller trial looking at ARDS, severe ARDS, 151 patients with acute respiratory failure who received nasal high flow in the first intervention. Uh, 45 of them of the 51 met ARDS criteria. Intubation, ra intubation rates of those patients treated with nasal high flow is about 40%, which the author said is about normal, which may be a little high. Overall mortality rate at 28 day mortality rate was about 30%. But if you look at those that failed nasal high flow therapy, they had a 50% mortality rate. And they said that it, their conclusion that it was, could be used in acute respiratory, severe ARDS, but they used it in caution with patients with high SAPs or organ failure, which was a lot of the patients in this group. The other thing we have to think about when we're using nasal high flow therapy is that when do we stop? When do we say that's enough? Uh, 
And this paper from Chung pointed out a retro retrospective observational study comparing outcomes of 175 patients who required intubation after failing nasal high flow, and they compared the two groups. They said early failure was patients, 130 patients less than 48 hours versus 45 patients who wore it for more than 48 hours. And they said that the early versus late, there was an increase in mortality, significant increase in mortality if you waited too long. Uh, there was longer weaning on the, on the uh, long-term nasal high flow plate patients. Uh, intubation, extubation success was actually uh, better in the nasal high flow patients that were early versus late. And I think that's the same. So what about just not acute respiratory failure patients or ARDS patients? What about overall patients? Can we just use it on almost anybody? And does it, if we need the humidity and we think we need high flow, does it truly make that much of a difference? I'd look at this study in randomized controlled trial of nasal high flow in the ER, the hot ERS study, and you can see that there was no difference in outcomes, One in tw no difference in outcomes of those requiring mechanical ventilation, hospital length of stay, mortality, conversion to me me ventilation in the mechanical ventilation in the ER, and they pointed out that one in 12 subjects also did not tolerate nasal high flow. So what's a rational approach to nasal high flow therapy? Well, considered in hypoxemia patients who are unresponsive to low flow therapy and do not tolerate non-invasive therapy, those patients who, may, who you know, look at, who are working hard, they need high flow. But I'd use it cautiously in patients with severe hypoxemia and extreme respiratory distress. We can't measure tidal volumes in these patients, but if I see a patient with extreme respiratory distress, I may try it for a while, but I'm going to keep an eye on them. We don't want patients with major organ dis dysfunction or severe hemodynamic st instability. If you're going to use it, use the highest flow possible, but make sure it's warm before you put it on, right? right? The whole trick behind this on tolerance is the heat and humidity. Closely monitor them for the first one to four hours, and because we can't measure tidal volumes, we need to monitor respiratory rate, our observed work of breathing. You can watch SpO2s, but I don't care if that's high, if they're working like mad. I have a very low threshold for escalation of treatment. So, and the bottom line is it clearly has better humidity and delivers higher FiO2 than conventional devices. Uh, decreases dead space, small amount of positive airway pressure, mean airway pressure, which results in increased respiratory rate, in decreased work of breathing, does increase tidal volumes, uh, and expiratory lung volume and oxygenation. Airway, the pressure that it generates, again, is highly variable from patient to patient and it does not equal CPAP or BiPAP. Other issues is if you have this, how are you going to transport them? It eats up a lot of gas, costs much more than conventional, but much less than non-invasive BiPAP or something. And again, I'm still concerned about tidal lines. Thank you.